Hey, what's going on guys? It's Mike, Phil Kraft Survival. I'm on the way to California to do some work, leaving Arizona on the road. Apologize for the noise, but I wanted to get this out here, especially with all the stuff going on with coronavirus. COVID-19, coronavirus infectious disease 19, it's becoming a serious issue in my understanding of preparedness and survival. And I wanna express and share some thoughts and ideas I have with you. One, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an expert in infectious disease. I have a degree in Homeland Security, a bachelor's degree in Homeland Security and Crisis Management. Uh, I have 20 years of operational experience in Special Forces, also as an OGA contractor with the US government. Uh, exclusively, my experience has been operations and counterterrorism, but I have a mild understanding of nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare because that was part of our operational requirements. But again, I am not the subject matter expert on infectious disease. I do want to express to you, I understand processes in preparation. I do understand how to make a deliberate plan, take information, digest that information, and then formulate a course of action or a plan that's going to work for you. That's why uh, I run Philcraft Survival as a CEO, and that's kind of the premise of my understanding and how I disseminate information. I have thought about this, I have researched it, I have constructed and formulated my own ideas, and all of this is based off of my own opinion and best practices. But my, my only goal and objective is not monetary gain here. We, we don't sell coronavirus kits. There is no monetary gain besides using this as an opportunity, um, selfishly for me, to get you to think about preparedness, but also by default as a benefit to you being more prepared for the eventuality of some of the predictions that I'm gonna uh, tell you guys about that might come true. All right, so first let's talk about some facts about the case as we know it. One, I'm not buying into the assumptions and uh, conspiracy theories about things that are potentially the source origin, the novelty of how things derived and then where they're going. Meaning World War Z, the manufactured bioterror war that's going on, all that shit, I'm leaving that conversation out of this. I wanna talk about what we currently understand. To currently to understand, we have to reference history here though. In 1918 to 1919, the, the coronavirus didn't exist, but the Spanish flu did. In the United States of America, it was brought back off of a boat after the war um, in 1918. This infected and subsequently uh, infected millions of people and killed hundreds of thousands of people in the United States of America. The estimates is about 675,000 Americans died between 1918 and 1919 from the Spanish influenza. World estimates are it killed 50 to 100 million on the far scale. That pandemic led to chaos and a whole bunch of considerations in the realm of how we looked at viruses uh, up until that point and now, today, how we look at viruses. That virus remained dormant uh, and actually vanished off the face of the earth in the 1950s and was brought back in the 1950s and then afterwards in the 1990s when it was synthesized by a scientist who extracted it from the lungs of an infected woman in Alaska from a Native American tribe. So H1N1, which was a, a subcategory, or I'm sorry, H1N1 with a subcategory of being the Spanish influenza, truly decimated our population. But the mortality rate was only 2%. 2% was the mortality rate that existed with the Spanish influenza. The current mortality rate with the coronavirus, which has been misskewed with disinformation and misinformation in the media, has has always been 2% and has been said that it's just like the common flu. It's not. The common flu last flu season from 2019, October of 2019 to February of 2020, infected 45 million people according to the CDC. This killed approximately 20 to 45,000 people in the United States of America. The mortality rate for the the standard flu type A, H1N1 and type B, is 0.1%, 0.1%. 
if we took this the Spanish influenza in 1918 to 19 and the coronavirus today uh, at two percent on at face value remember that in 1918 and 1919 we didn't understand infectious disease like we do today we didn't have uh, the, the trauma and healthcare system that we currently have today we didn't have respirators we did have a lot of the technology that keeps people alive today. Most people back then died of bacterial pneumonia and other complications from the disease. Today, coronavirus causes viral pneumonia, which no amount of antibiotics will help. 80% of those infected will recover, according to the CDC. 20% of the people infected with the coronavirus will be hospitalized, and 2% of that 20% will die. With that being said, let's say, for example, this last flu season, which I just quoted, 45 million people were infected and 45,000 people died. If you replaced the 2% mortality rate of the coronavirus with the 0.1 mortality rate of the standard flu, your mortality rate wouldn't be 45,000. It would be 900,000. 900,000. Some people have asked, hey, where did that derive from? Where did the 45,000, I'm sorry, where did the 2% mortality rate derive from? The 2% stems from a study that the Chinese did of 45,000 people infected with the coronavirus and then taking the, the people who died and labeling that the mortality rate, which is a good test bed for doing a study when you have 45,000 people die and then a certain amount of them die and you determine that's the mortality rate, that's a good example of taking from the pool of people infected how many people are potentially gonna die. There are variables that exist. One, you can't say uh, exclusively that the people who died in China is going to re reflect on specific countries' abilities. In fact, the mortality rate in Iran right now is a lot higher than the mortality rate in China. So it fluctuates. And I'm not specifically saying that the mortality rate is going to be 2% once it infects the United States of America. But what I am saying, which a lot of people aren't, is that the United States of America will be infected grossly with the coronavirus. You can't stop a pandemic. We haven't labeled this a pandemic yet, but you can't stop what's going to happen. Every single day, more people have been reported as infected. Here's the problem. People are always are already infected. They are already infected. When somebody says the first case of a person in the United States of America that tested positive from coronavirus with no travel history, they didn't manifest that them, themselves inside of their body and then one day wake up with the coronavirus. They were infected by somebody who has the virus already but has it been reported? Why would you not report that you have the coronavirus? Well, one, all the symptoms are similar to what you would see with a standard flu type A or type B. And two, because the mortality rate isn't that high, people are under-reporting it because if you think you have the flu or think you have a virus, some people just don't go to the hospital to get tested. And those people who are infected are infecting other people who are testing positive. So if we think that this is going to be controlled, we'd be mistaken. I could reference uh, pandemics, viruses, swine flu, bird flu, and the list goes on. This will not be stopped because people who live their everyday lives in freedom and democracies are not going to stop living their lives in freedom and democracies. They're just going to do what they do, and then they're going to continue to get infected. What's happening is an overplay and an underestimate, uh, underestimation of people's reaction to what's going on. Some people are saying, don't buy into the hype. Well, I don't think there's hype. I'm not, I'm not watching the news channels that are talking about this could be a manufactured weapon of mass destruction. What I'm paying attention to are the numbers, is the data are the scientists, the CDC. Also, some people are saying that we are over-inflating a problem 
that is just as common as the flu and cold. When the answer, when the reality is, it's not even close. Because again, if we just take 45 million people, which is one sixth of the population, and instead infect them with the coronavirus at the current mortality rate, you're looking at 900,000 people dead instead of 45,000 people dead. Just that number alone should concern you. Like people say, well, why would you even be bothered? It's just, you're gonna get it anyway. It's just a flu, who cares? Well, number one, the coronavirus originated supposedly via the reports in a wet market in Wuhan, China. Wet market is a market in which they, they uh, kill animals in the market to give the freshest meat possible, which are ridden with bacteria, uh, which, you know, the swine flu, the bird flu, all these different uh, uh, issues have derived from supposedly. So if we just take it at fa face value for what it is, would you want to be infected? Would you want your kids, your wife, your family, your friends infected with something that originated in a wet market in Wuhan, China? The answer for me is no. I don't want to get sick, period. So if we take that at face value, which is we have an infectious disease in a virus that is making its way through the United States of America, do you want to get sick? Go ahead and take your chances and roll the dice. In a small circle of 300 friends and associates, six people, six of your friends and associates would die. That to me is a lot of people. I, I don't have any friends or family that have died from the flu in, in my lifetime that I know of. But I promise you, if this spreads like I know it will, that there will be people in your circle, maybe even close in your circle, that will die. And so that's something to think about and something to remember. Outside of that, how do we prepare for it? Well, the preparation is just like that of the common flu and common cold. Meaning, we don't have to really change much about what we do independently for the exception of isolation and quarantining ourselves. And what I mean by that is, if you are trying to prevent a cold or infection from the flu, what are you gonna do? One, good hygiene, you're gonna wash your hands. Hand sanitizer, uh, hand sanitizer. You're going to use hand sanitizer. Good hygiene practices, not touching infected surfaces, not touching your mouth. Covering your, not your mouth, uh, using your uh, hand to cover your mouth, sneezing into your elbow, sneezing into your arm. Uh, staying home when you're sick. All of these things are common to the flu and common to infectious uh, viruses. But the difference for the coronavirus is in what we don't understand uh, and how it spreads. In addition to that, what we don't know of what happens when somebody's infected and then they get reinfected, even to the extent of how animals are infected. Uh, an animal, for example, can get infected by H1N1 or type A flu. So your dog could get sick from H1N1. Well, they just tested a pet, a domesticated dog in China, which China has a horrible track record of having pets and taking care of animals, period. But a dog tested for a low positive and they quarantined the dog. So can your dog get sick? Because if your dog can get sick, and your dog gets sick but you don't realize it and your dog infects everybody in your family because it loves to get pet loves to get petted then you're not paying attention to what this really is because this is a little bit more complex we don't even know if it can stay alive on surfaces for extended periods of time because the common flu can last about two to eight hours there's been potential talk and recorded cases of conversations of people saying that it could potentially last days. If that's the case, again, it would be very different. There's even discussion, which I won't talk about in depth because I don't know all the facts, is that this particular virus has a mutation or um, a, a genetic structure that allows it to be more resilient because of how it embeds itself in the body, similar to the structure of, of somebody infected with HI, uh, HIV. Vaccines. If a vaccine was made tomorrow, would you inject it into your body? The answer for me is absolutely not. So it's very different because we don't have a real clear understanding of what the future looks like. We don't know what tomorrow is going to look like, let alone a year from now. 
here's the biggest threat to me preparation wise or survival wise one let's just take what we know about what's happened thus far with companies and the government nike closed down its factory in oregon the headquarters you imagine that if you're a corporation and you want to keep your employees safe because you don't want the liability and you want to protect the people who work for your company if one person gets infected in the area or in your company would you show up the next day and make everybody come to work and risking their potential lives with exposure to other people the answer would probably be no in best practices so let's say tomorrow a company like I don't know Shell gas station Shell a gas company comes in and they have one person that was infected with the coronavirus and they shut down the headquarters of operations that controls the management of supply chain and they do so in the best uh, practice of protecting their employees and the people uh, who they who they hold closest now how does that affect the supply chain I imagine that shutting down Nike headquarters is going to affect people's abilities to get shoes and put them on their feet. Maybe not in the short term, but maybe maybe the midterm or long term. Maybe tomorrow you can go pick up a, a pair of Nikes from the store on Amazon. But we already saw what the N95 and N99 mask hysteria did. People start talking about the mask and saying that's the way to protect yourself. And now we're in a a, a U.S. if not worldwide shortage of masks. So much so, the director of the CDC came out and said, can you stop please buying masks? Because number one, masks don't work. But number two, you're taking away from my CDC representatives and first responders who actually need the mask. We're already meet, seeing the supply chain challenges that are going to arise. Now we go back to the gas station thing. Let's just say one gas station, Shell, gets knocked out and now no gas stations in your community that are shell gas stations are going to be able to resupply which leaves an opportunity for other gas stations to, to rise to the top BP's the Texaco's even if I don't even know if Texaco even exists anymore but you see these guys rise to the top and they say oh we're gonna supply the chain well what happens when they get infected and best practices what are they gonna do Walmart uh, Name any supply chain in your environment, in your in your area. That's kind of the best case scenario, right? Because we know that's already happened. That's happening with several companies. In fact, it's happening with institutions. First responder institutions. A local uh, fire department responds to a person who winds up being infected with the coronavirus. What do they do to that local department? They, they quarantine them. So we have first responders that for the first time probably in modern history are quarantined because they came across somebody who was infected with the coronavirus. Now, how do you see that playing out? Because what happens to a hospital where people are infected, now the nurses and the doctors and the institution are completely infected. They have to quarantine themselves. Now we have first responders who arrive as police officers and firefighters and paramedics and they arrive and they're infected. Now they are quarantined because nobody wants to get infected by them. That same scale is going to be what happens to corporations and supply chain management. Let's imagine a world where tomorrow morning, just like a lot of schools have already done, a lot of institutions have already done, a lot of marathon races have done. You wake up tomorrow morning and your kid, your kid's school, you can't go to school because your kid's school, you had one student who was infected with the coronavirus. So now your kid can't go to school. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna send him to daycare? Uh, are you gonna stay at home and provide that care for yourself? Now, you imagine you wake up tomorrow morning and the company you work for says, hey, you can't work here. We're gonna pay you, but you can't work. So besides the obvious economic woes that you're gonna see, that's already happening with the stock market and the inability for China to send uh, import and export goods because of what's going on. Now imagine in your own community, in your own world, this starts to happen. Again, this is best case. Let's get to worst case. 
So you take a metropolitan area like the San Francisco Bay Area, 7 mil, New York, 10 mil, Denver, Colorado, 3 mil. And you take any one of those cities and there's one person that's infected. If you have one person that's infected in a major metropolitan area, you better believe you have multiple people that are infected. The only difference and the only unknown is it hasn't been reported yet. But assume that if there's one, there's more. So now you have a place like San Francisco where thousands of people are infected. What are you gonna do? Well, the government has already said we have a protocol in place through the CDC, through the through FEMA, through the uh, federal government that says we are going to figure out a way to quarantine and lock these people down. But what happens if they can't identify who's sick and who's not? So what are you gonna do? Well, one, you, you would quarantine and isolate. It's called containment. You would surround the objective area where people are infected and you would create uh, filters. People who are coming and going, you would try to filter out the, the healthy and keep in uh, the sick and, and manage that. But how do you manage it when the healthcare systems that exist in those systems are already overwhelmed? Where nobody's going to school, where now we can't resupply the people in that quarantine area because they can't, there's so many people densely populated that they can't provide their own support. Electricity's overwhelmed, healthcare's overwhelmed, the supply chain's overwhelmed, and people are overwhelmed. Then what starts what start, starts to happen when people start, start dying at a 2% mortality rate? If you took half the population, half the population at 165 million, which would be the worst case scenario, 2% of 165 million, if half our population was infected, infected would be 3.3 million people. Over 3 million people would die. So what happens when people start dying? Well, one, we start asking the questions and we start asking for solutions. But what if there is none? Because people are just gonna get sick and people are gonna live and people are gonna die. But the supply chains be, uh, become suppressed, people become paranoid, chaotic, and then you have the fallout of the worst case scenario, which is violence, which is desperation, which is evil men that are waiting for opportunities to exploit and take advantage of good people. So what happens when this chaos and calamity ha happen, where people clash with the government because they refuse to be quarantined? San Francisco, maybe, but take a place like, I don't know, New York City, Take a place like Philadelphia. Take a place like Denver, Colorado. Are people going to allow themselves to be quarantined without putting up a fight? I know if you quarantine me and my family in the middle of a metropolitan area where people were infected and sick, what I would do. I would try my best, knowing that my family was safe, to get out of that area and get as rural as possible. The question I was asked this morning is, how are densely populated urban environments going to be affected uh, when compared to other places that are more rural. The more rural you are, the less likely you are to get infected and the more likely you are to survive. That's the bottom line. That's with proper preparation. So what is proper preparation? Here we go. Minimum, 90 days of survival. And I say survival because it's not 90 days worth of food. It's not 90 days worth of water. It's 90 days of self-sustainment. Tomorrow morning, you wake up and you're forced to live in your own house, which is the only way you won't be infected, and defend it and live in it for 90 days. That's the minimum. So, food, of course. Dry good foods. Most dry good food store, uh, storage places are getting sold out. Mountain House, Valley Food Storage, they can't keep up with the demand. So what do you do? You go buy beans, you go buy rice, you go buy uh, canned vegetables, which you could buy right now off the shelf. Canned tuna, the list goes on. Canned food can last anywhere from two years to 10 years. Jarred food can last anywhere from a year to five years. Learn how to jar, learn how to can, and stockpile enough food for your entire family. This includes household pets. That's number one. Water, it's not just about getting enough water for 90 days, it's about containing enough water for an indefinite period of time. Because if I just told you to prepare for 
90 days worth of water, that would be so much water you probably couldn't account for. Because the average person, the average male needs seven liters of water a day. That's average, depending on, on what you're made of. I'm 240 pounds, I need more water than the average dude. So not only a means to have water on hand for you and your family, but enough water to hold and sustain yourself for a period of time, which means containers. It doesn't just have to be a jug. It could be blivets, it could be bladders, it could be bags, it could be vessels, it could be your bathtub. Not just enough to store water, but also to sanitize water. Chlorine dioxide, household bleach, um, uh, iodine tablets, uh, fire to boil water. Do you have enough pots and pans to boil water? 90 days of food, 90 days of water. Basic hygiene, toilet paper, baby wipes, hand sanitizer, all of these things are gonna keep you clean and keep you from not getting infectious bacterial infections while you're lying dormant on your own away from civilization, away from people, right? When I was in ranger school, we had guys getting cellulitis on their knees, which is an, a bacterial infection that was taking them out of ranger school for in only a couple weeks, where nooks and crannies of your joints, right? Your elbows, your knees, even your face, they start to crack and then they get infected. We were getting bacterial infections from taking knees pulling security behind trees in the middle of the woods. So you imagine if you don't have a means to keep yourself clean, soap. Soap actually is a chemical process to remove bacteria and dirt away from your body. You need soap. You need baby wipes. You need hand sanitizer. You need toilet paper. What is your plan when you can't flush your toilet anymore and you have to remove that waste away from your home? Are you gonna burn it? I recommend you burn it, but do you have a plan for that? In addition to that, in the same category as hygiene, you need to, to keep and retain house, uh, in your house, antibiotics and medicine that is related to your potential uh, health situation. If you're type one, type two diabetic, do you have enough insulin on hand to last? If you have a compromised immune system, if you have an ailment, if you have an injury, are you prepared to deal with that injury for the long-term survival circumstance? Where you can't go to the hospital, where you can't go to the doctor. Remember, in survival, I always tell people, yourself as an individual, if I carry a tourniquet on my person, I want an aid bag or an ambulance in my vehicle. I want a hospital in my home. All these things are relevant in, in long-term survival. So you have to be prepared. Find the dark web and find ways to retain long-term uh, antibiotics and other medicine that's important for your survival. Survival and trauma uh, for our first aid are staples of your long-term survival. Fuel, I just don't mean fuel in your car, which is hugely important. If you plan to have a vehicle that it's going to be your mobility platform to get you to and from uh, the supply chain that currently exists to barter with neighbors, to get to your social network, hell, to get out in the woods and hunt, you need fuel, not only in your rig, but you need fuel set aside as a reservoir for other considerations as well. Propane, is your house fueled by propane? My heater in my house is fueled by propane, but so is my Generac 17 kilowatt generator when my electricity goes out. Inevitably, inside of a quarantined environment that's chaotic, you will lose the infrastructure, including your ability to make a phone call, your ability to send an email, your ability to get electricity pumped into your house. So how are you gonna deal with that? Well, my generator, for example, can run almost two weeks off of a 500 gallon propane tank. These are the questions you need to ask, or ask yourself. There are a lot of considerations here in preparation, but the question you need to ask yourself is tomorrow morning, if you wake up and you need to survive for 90 days, how are you gonna do it? Sit down with your family, mental model, and project courses of action that are gonna set you up for success in the eventuality, in my understanding of this event, not just a potential circumstance, but the eventuality that this happens. My 
prediction is in one year's time, 20% of the United States of America will be infected with coronavirus. Will that grossly affect our supply chain, our security, uh, the, our way of life? It will, 100% it will. But this leads into the preparation phase. What are you gonna do about it? I advise that you stay tuned, uh, stay plugged in to Phil Kraus Survival, our podcast. I just did a podcast yesterday with uh, Kevin Owens uh, where we talked about this kind of stuff. There is no drawbacks to investing in preparedness for you and your family. There's a financial obligation, but it's an investment in your future. Please get prepared, please be ready, and please stay educated. Thanks for tuning in, guys. It's been 30 minutes of me running my mouth. Uh, hopefully, you were bearing through the wind. It's super windy here as I drive into uh, California to knock this meeting out. Um, we truly care about you guys at Fieldcraft Survival. It is our life mission to talk about preparedness, and it is our purpose. If you have any questions, leave them in the feedback. We'll make sure we get to those questions. I appreciate all the, all the, all the comments and feedback that you guys give us. Fieldcraftsurvival.com. Make sure you subscribe. Until next time, stay alert, stay alive, guys.